thank you for joining us on the Voice of Pancreatic Cancer podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Weinberg, with the Sina Magwitz Foundation. Now, if you don't know about the Sina Magwitz Foundation, we are a nonprofit that's committed to the awareness, prevention, and cure of pancreatic cancer. And one of the ways we do that is through partnerships like the one we have with the Medical College of Wisconsin. And today we actually have Dr. Kathleen Christians. She's a professor of surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Christians, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Today we'll be talking about robotic surgery. But before we get into that, I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, We wouldn't be here without you and we're able to make a difference in people's lives because of you. So thank you so much. And Dr. Christians, um, let's just jump right into it with your background. People want to know where you came from, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, it's interesting, actually. I came from a small farming community in rural Iowa, actually. And yeah. I was a farmer's daughter. And uh, I spent a great deal of time in hospital settings because my uh, mother was actually a liver transplant patient. Oh, wow. And, uh, she had a uh, autoimmune disease. So we ended up uh, uh, spending a lot of time in hospital settings. And I also was in a lot of sports. So um, I ended up with quite a few injuries along the way here and there. And I uh, just fell into medicine that way. Um, I, I trained at the University of Iowa for medical school. And then um, for residency, I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And then I did two fellowships, one in um, surgical critical care. And then I did a subsequent uh, hepatopancreatic biliary surgery fellowship, which is how I ended up doing a significant portion of pancreatic surgery in my practice. So um, I've been at the medical college for about 20 years now as an attending. So, Wow. So you decided not to go into the family industry of farming. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love it. It's great to visit, but uh, um, I uh, prefer medicine. So Okay, and what was it specifically about uh, pancreatic cancer that drew you? Well, um, I I love the whole being able to meet these patients in some of the worst moments of their lives, and um, not you're not delivering great news, but the key part of it is you're delivering hope, a message of hope. You have treatments, you have ways to help. Uh, push this disease forward and hopefully make it either a chronic disease or make it go away in the future. And there are, you know, daily new findings in pancreatic cancer, and it's just an exciting field and exciting time to be in this. And uh, it, that's what drove me to it. I love taking care of patients with this disease. They, they really have their priorities straight and they're wonderful humans. Yeah, it's true. I I mean, we talked to Dr. Evans and that was one of the things he said about pancreatic cancer. He said, the only uh, pre-existing condition is nice. You know, (laughs) every every pancreatic cancer patient is nice. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Yeah, just wonderful people. So it's amazing that you're being able to provide help to patients like that every day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, And so for pancreatic cancer um, patients, I know you started uh, with your fellowship with surgeries. About how many surgeries do you do like on average now, say within like a month timeline? Uh, Well, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking pancreas only or if you're talking, because I am HPV trained. So I also do liver, gallbladder, bile duct, et cetera. But uh, we do a lot of pancreas cancer surgery here. So it's not uncommon to you know, even do five or six per week of major cases. So it just, it just depends. Depends on the week. Um, you know, it ebbs and flows with the number of cases and the patients coming through. Um, but, you know, we, it's a very high volume center here. So we're, you know, you know, close to hundred a year, sometimes higher of pancreas cancer cases. Um, so yeah, we, we see a lot of it. Wow. And um, before we like dive into the type of surgeries. I know for some patients and a lot of their families, the terminology can be a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be helpful if uh, you wouldn't mind explaining um, the terms like minimally invasive surgery, uh, laroscopic surgery, and robotic surgery, just before we get into it too deep. Sure. So, I mean, the whole concept of minimally invasive surgery is basically um, you're trying to do less damage to the tissues. 
So what that translates into is smaller incisions and um, less trauma essentially to the abdominal wall or in the abdominal cavity. At least that's the overall concept. The difference between laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery is basically how you get to the anatomy that you need to. So in laparoscopic surgery, you put these little tubes called cannulas in through the abdominal wall through these tiny incisions. And you insert instruments through those tubes and you basically have put uh, gas into the patient's abdomen. You can see what's going on on a computer screen, almost like watching TV. And then you insert these instruments and you can do what you need to do through those cannulas. Robotic surgery is a little bit step further where it's not actually the robot doing the surgery. So you're in the operating room, you're sitting at what they call a console, which is basically a computer screen that you're controlling. And your motions are controlling the instruments of the robot. And what the robot does is it makes this much more precise. And so um, the robot takes away, you know, um, any kind of added motion, it's much more precise, it's high, vis high um, magnification, 3D vision, so you can do very precise work with the robot. So it, it's a whole spectrum and, and different cases are more appropriate for different modalities. And so there's nuances to whether one modality should be used or, or the other. Is the robot sort of like mimicking your hand motions? Is that how it works? Um, well, so you're at this computer screen, it, the, maybe a better way to say it is, um, like if you're playing video games as a kid, you are actually controlling this small thing that's right beside you, but then it makes the motions on the screen. So you are, con your fingers and your wrists are actually controlling the computer, so to speak, which then translates it to the robot and the motion is done. And so you're behind the whole thing, but the robot then makes it precise. Why would a patient consider or want a minimally invasive approach? I mean, it sounds like a common sense uh, decision, but I'm, I know there's a lot more involved. Well, the advantages to it are they're smaller incisions done correctly. There's less blood loss, less trauma um, that the patient has to heal up from. Many will say it's less painful, meaning translating into getting back to normal regular activities sooner and or to the workforce sooner, depending on what your job is. And those are kind of the big perks for it. Um, it's also smaller incisions. So if cosmetics or, you know, looks are important to people, sometimes that's a big deal. And so it's improved cosmetics and things like that as well. Okay. So then why wouldn't a patient uh, choose that? I mean, if it's an option. Right. So it, from the standpoint of the, it's more about what's appropriate for the particular case. So there, it, it's maybe easier to say what's not appropriate for a robot surgery. So in somebody that has had a bunch of operations in their abdomen before where the scar tissue is dense and you can't inflate the space so you can see or you can't get to it because it's so densely adherent, those kind of patients are not appropriate for minimally invasive surgery. Uh, in other cases, either the tumor or what you need to remove is so large, it makes no sense whatsoever to try to do it through tiny incisions, only to make a big incision to remove remove what you need to. And the other prob probably final thing would be some of these cases, the tumor is very densely adherent or involving the blood vessels. And some of that really intricate work really can't be done um, uh, in a minimally invasive fashion because it's simply not safe. So there's a there's a spectrum of what can be done and what can't be done. And every patient is a little bit individual in terms of whether they're a candidate or not. Okay. And then this might be a crazy question, but if, if you start out with a minimally invasive surgery, um, is there an opportunity like if to switch midway if the patient needed? Yeah, um, certainly, certainly. If you it, it is you can absolutely start minimally invasively. So if there's a question that you may or may not be able to do it minimally invasively, we can always start that way. And if it's just not possible from the scar tissue or you can't see, you can certainly convert to open. 
it'd be very difficult or not really useful to go the other way, like start open and then do it minimally invasively. That would be not, not worth it, but they certainly uh, the other way around. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about laparoscopic, um, how that's, I know you kind of explained the differences between the two, but how do you decide which one to use? Okay. So the, the subtle differences between laparoscopic and robotic is that robotic is two dimensional and the instrumentation is what, uh, what I like to explain as kind of chopsticks. So anything you can do, you can't see my hands, but up, down, sideways, kind of like that. Whereas robotic, you d can do anything wristed motion. So anything your wrist and your fingers can do, the robot can do. So the robot gives you more freedom of motion. It has higher magnification than laparoscopically and it's 3D as opposed to 2D. And so there are nuances to the robot that make some cases simpler. The One of the things that non-surgeons would not appreciate is that there's no tactile sensation on robotic surgery. It's all visual feedback. So what that means is on the cases where we're laparoscopic or open, we can feel. We can either feel the response on the instrument or we're actually feeling it with our hands. Whereas in the robot, the, the robot is basically between you. So your feedback is visual. So there's a little bit difference in terms of those kind of things, but that that's more from a surgeon's perspective. So anything else that's drastically different as far as like in the moment in the surgery? Mm, not necessarily. I mean, you can, you can do anything laparoscopic that you can do robotic and vice versa. It is, it, many people will say it's easier to sew robotically because you have the full motion of your wrist. Um, and people, uh, it, instead of trying to sew, if you can think about it again with chopsticks, as opposed to anything your wrist can do motion wise, it's just simply easier. And so the, the learning curve uh, seems to be less with sewing things robotically, um, those kind of things. So just some subtle nuances, but for the most part, you can do the same thing laparoscopically as robotically for the most part. There's just some subtle improvements with the robot. Now there are certain cases also where you, you really need to have um, some tactile sensation to be doing it safely and in those cases you would do it laparoscopically or what they call laparoscopic hand assisted where you would insert one hand and do the rest with instrumentation with your other hand so there's there's all these kind of gradations of what you can actually do so so that sounds like it's almost like a combination yeah exactly exactly oh, okay um that's, and, and it's interesting because I would think just from an outside perspective that the um, robotic would be, um, have less motion, I guess, of your wrist and things like that, but it's actually the opposite. Yeah. Well, you have, you have more degrees of freedom, so to speak. So. Yeah. It makes sense now that you explain that. It's, yeah. it's really cool. Uh, so when you first started doing these surgeries, was there like a drastic learning curve? Yeah. Well, so I think the key to being a good minimally invasive surgeon is that you've done plenty, plenty of cases open. Because if you know and understand the anatomy and the subtleties of aberrant anatomy or, or anatomy that's not standard, then the things that you see in three-dimensional or two-dimensional laparoscopically or robotically are not surprises and you can adapt to them. Right. So, I mean, you certainly have to learn the instrumentation, the um, robotic system. The, they put you through all sorts of uh, simulations uh, that they actually have with the robot. Then they advance to animal surgery where you're using it on live tissue. And then finally, you go through this whole proctoring with uh, people that have been doing robotic surgery for a while. So there's a very stepwise gradation with that. Laparoscopic surgery has been around for a lot longer. I think it was started in the 80s, if I remember correctly. And so uh, a lot of that is now being taught at the resident level, even from interns onward. Um, the robotic surgery is now actually also being brought into the curriculum uh, for surgical residents. So they are now getting onboarded earlier. So it really that a uh, lot of that learning curve will 
will be even less and less and less because it will be now part of the training for surgeons across the board. So it, it will no longer be new technology. It will be standard technology. So, and in many places it already is. We have it in our, in our curriculum already as well, in both laparoscopic and robotic. So. And do you see that as a, like a positive thing moving forward with that the students are coming up, learning all these different areas of, or ways of surgery? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that the best thing for the patient is deciding the modality that works best for their particular problem. So if you're only facile in one mode of surgery, then that is the only thing you're able to offer a patient. Whereas if you have been trained in all these things and you're facile in all modalities, then if their tumor lends it to one type versus another, you can say, sure, I do that. I can take care of that. I'm good at this. And I can tell you these results. So I think it's absolutely important that it, that training is early and often. So. And that kind of leads into my next question. If you are a patient and um, your, your surgeon offers uh, these two opportunities, how, what's the minimum number of surgeries that you would think um, would be required that would make a patient feel confident in a doctor? You know, if they say, oh yeah, I've done this twice before, um, you know what I mean, is that enough? Right, no, I mean, so this, that's a very hard question to answer because it also depends where you are in your career. So have you just started out and you're just in your earliest training or have you done you know, 200 of these open and none of this anatomy is a surprise because it, I think it's much easier to adapt if you've done a bunch of these cases open because you know all the nuances of the anatomy that you can run into. So I think, it, it, I think it's more important to, um, it's not a hard, fast number because some people, you know, just like an analogy to sports, there's some people that are natural athletes and they can, you know, shoot a hoop for, or shoot a free throw in a basketball game and get it immediately. And there's others that it might take, you know, 10 times for them to figure out the form. So I, I think the hard, fast number is not critical, but I mean, you certainly wouldn't want somebody that's in the single digits during your surgery. So but I think it's I think it's important that the person also has established the open experience, so there's no surprises when you get to the minimally invasive. Because if you do have issues, you can't get there nearly as fast when you're in a minimally invasive uh, moment, because you essentially have to then open the patient to correct whatever it is if you can't correct it minimally invasively. So yeah. you're limited on your range of motion. Well, you're limited. You have to actually get into the abdomen. So that would be an open incision. And so there's a delay of, of taking care of whatever it may be. So okay. so it's important to, to basically not get into any trouble to begin with. So when comparing the surgeries, um, is one done in less time than the other? Or does it really just depend on case by case? Um, so that would be, depend more on your experience. So usually the more you do of these, the quicker you are at them for the, for the most part. So you, you, do be, you do learn the tricks and you just become more efficient. And it's also critical of the teams in the operating room too, especially the more equipment that you get, the more they're able to troubleshoot things, know the instrumentation, know what you need at certain times. All of that uh, plays into your efficiency in the operating room. Okay. And then I know you talked about um, some patients saying that one hurts less than another. Um, is there a healing time difference? Well, the, you still have to do all of the wound healing time-wise, but the incisions are smaller. And in a, in a minimally invasive uh, format, you tend to have less tissue trauma. So there, there are studies that show that it is less painful and it is faster recovery because you have less tissue damage, basically. Okay. So, so would that would affect the down, like your downtime. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, but you still have to have the wound. You can't really speed up wound healing, but you have less trauma and smaller wounds to heal. If you know what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So. We want to, I want to talk to you about survival advantage. Is there any one versus the other? 
No, I mean, you'll see some isolated reports in the literature touting that this minimally invasive thing or that minimally invasive thing adds survival. I think you have to be very careful with that because it's not about the tool that you use to get there. It's how you actually conduct the operation. So let's say, for instance, you go in there and you take out somebody's pancreatic cancer robotically, but you leave the lymph nodes behind and inappropriately stage them. You haven't done them any favors. So yes, you did the case robotically, but you didn't do it correctly. So it's not about the tool that you use. It's about the it's about making sure you do an appropriate cancer operation. So it's it you can do any of these surgeries great with great um, results, um, but you have to you basically have to know what you're doing and you have to understand the cancer surgery behind it. Take enough of the margin, take enough of the lymph nodes, make sure you've covered everything oncologically correctly. And whether you do that open, whether you do it robotically, whether you do it laparoscopically, it doesn't matter, but it needs to be the same operation no matter what modality you use. And that's what affects your longevity, basically. Keeping all of those things in consideration, then what kind of questions should uh, patients be asking their medical team? Like, how do they come to the conclusion of which one is better for them? Yeah, I mean, I... I think what how I would approach it is I would ask my surgeon, which modality do you think would be better for my particular tumor, my particular case, my particular history? And any surgeon that is any good should be able to tell you that. They should be able to say, well, I think you would be best fit for this, this, or this, and tell you why um, you would do it that way. And, and it's not... Um, and if the a minimally invasive approach is not offered to you, it's well within bounds to ask, well, what about laparoscopic or what about robotic? And they should have a good answer for you. They should say, well, it doesn't fit because you've had 12 abdominal operations and we expect this to be frozen and very hard to get to or whatever the answer may be. But there should be an appropriate answer for that. And then, you know, and how many, how many years you've been operating is probably more important than how many cases have you done. Um, you just don't want somebody, you know, fresh out in their practice and, you know, that, that hasn't seen a lot or hasn't done a lot. So those are the kind of things that you'd want. And then what's their average length of stay? Um, how do the patients do? We have, you know, we have all of our outcomes published. Um, at our institution, you can see all that data. And that's important. I mean, you need to know what your outcomes are. Um, do they know their personal outcomes? Do they know their morbidity, mortality rates, their expected survival rates, those kind of things. And, and uh, they should be able to provide that data for you. So um, it would be appropriate for patients to ask, what's the average length of stay like at the oh. hospital for other patients and, and success rate numbers, like asking for those hard facts. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's uh, they should be, every surgeon should know their own outcomes and their institutional outcomes. And from the post-operative standpoint, we have a whole pathway of how these cases should go. So from the minute they hit the door until the expected um, day of discharge, this is what happens on every day. So if you have a Whipple, this is your pathway. If you have a distal, this is your pathway. If you have a middle segment pancreatectomy or nucleation or something, this is the anticipated what's going to happen each day. And so we actually even have some boards in the room where the patient can just look. It's day three. This is what's going to happen today. And this is you know, the expectation. So they can see if they're on course. And um, I think it's I think it's great because you know, then the expectations are there. They know what they should be doing, they know what they should be expecting. And uh, it just works well all around. So, yeah. And if, if a patient asks these questions and they're met with like hesitation, or um, maybe it takes some time for the, them to get that information, would that uh, give you any pause that maybe they're not in the right place? Oh, you mean if the if the surgeon hesitates with their answers? Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you have to you have to take the social cues with it. But I mean, if they're um, I mean, every surgeon should be able to answer that honestly. So, and quickly. <laughs> so. Is there any question that you would say, this is the question I would ask? I think the biggest thing is, 
you know, kind of the big picture view of how much surgery do they do? How often do you operate? How many cases do you do a year? Maybe, you know, cause it gives you an idea of the volume, their efficiency, how much, how much they do in a year as opposed to, okay, how many whipples did you do last week or how many, you know what I mean? It's kind of the, what's the global picture because every time a surgeon is in the operating room, they're learning more. They're learning how to be more efficient. They're learning, you know, they're seeing different and new anatomy and nuances because we learn something. Every time we see a patient or operate on a patient, we learn something new. And uh, I tell my residents that the day that you stop learning is the day you need to hang up your scalpel because every patient teaches you something. And um, I, I think that's critical. So I think from a patient's perspective, you really want somebody that's experienced and knows what they're doing, uh, especially in cancer cases, because you got to get it right, because um, it will affect their outcomes. And I, I guess that would be good advice for the patient too. I mean, to do their own research and and not just be told this is how it is, but be seeking education in forms of things like this podcast. And right. Right. what do you think about second opinions? Yeah, I mean, we encourage people to get second opinions. We have a second opinion program here. So we frequently will see people um, to provide our opinion. But I, anytime somebody asks me, well, I hear what you're saying, but what do you think about me getting a second opinion? I say, great, go get a second opinion, be as informed as you possibly can, and then make an educated decision. Because people do the best postoperatively when they're informed, when they're comfortable with their surgeon, when they're comfortable with the institution where they're going. If they are nervous, are they suspicious, or they don't trust whatever it may be, they don't do well. It doesn't matter if you do a perfect surgery. The, that link with their surgeon has to be there and with the medical team in that place. So I absolutely tell people, you want to get a second opinion? Great. Go do it. Get peace of mind and make an educated decision. Awesome. And then with all of your years of experience doing this, are there any particular cases or patients that um, are remarkable in your mind that stand out? Any stories that you could share with us? Yeah, that's that. I mean, we could talk for hours, actually. I mean, there there we do some very, very complex, difficult surgeries here. And we've had many, many patients that have been turned down in other institutions as this is not operable. Um, you can't do it because, actually you can't do it because why? And, um, and those are probably the most rewarding because they come in, these patients come in very dejected. You can see they're at the end of the rope. They've been told, you know, one, sometimes three or four times that no way can we do this. And then you can provide that hope and then getting them through a successful operation. It's just, it is so rewarding. It's one of the most rewarding things we do. And uh, so there, I, I, I have so many stories like that. I, it's almost like too numerous to, to count really, but uh, those are exciting. It's exciting, not only for the patient, but also for the family because they're very invested and they've you know, brought them to a bunch of different places to try to figure out if somebody can help them. And so when you get them, when you get them through that surgery there, it's, it's so rewarding for everybody. So what would you say to a patient or a family that's going through something like that right now? I mean, maybe they've heard multiple times that there's nothing that can be done. Well, I, you know, it's a lot of these people have already um, done their research. They, they, you know, obviously look at, internet podcasts like this and go to places that are high volume and have the people that do this day in and day out look at these kind of things. Because, you know, the whether something is surgically resectable or not is in what I say in the eyes of the beholder. So it has to do with the experience of the sur surgeon, the experience of the institution, how much um, uh, ancillary services you have, how much backup you have. Because you know, you're, let's face it, you're not going to do a very high-end surgery with, you know, blood vessel reconstruction, et cetera, that's very high risk in the middle of nowhere because it's it's not safe for anybody. It's not safe for the patient. You, the surgeon doesn't have any backup, et cetera. So do your research, do your homework. Most of the places that are second opinion and high volume are well 
seen on the internet and you can you can easily find it and go seek care whatever these places that are closest to you i mean there's they're scattered throughout the country now so that each section of the country should have a place where you can go if, if travel is an issue but if you're able to do air travel you can pretty much get to anywhere these days so finally sort of wrapping things up here um let's talk about organizations like the Sina Magwitz Foundation and other nonprofits. In your experience, um, how vital are these organizations to the fight against pancreatic cancer? Oh, I mean, organizations like this are absolutely critical. Not only does it it bring awareness to the cause, but it it helps us get the message out there. It helps push cancer research ahead. It helps um, patients and families find out what's out there and help get the care that they need. It, you you can't do your job without nonprofits like SEMA. Just can't. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And thank you for your time. I know you're a busy woman. Uh, we appreciate you. And is there anything you want to add? Anything that I missed? No, I mean, I think it's great. Um, you know, we, we, as Dr. Evans had said, we love our pancreas cancer patients. They're wonderful people, and we hope to continue to take care of them in the future and make this disease go away sometime soon. That's our that's our dream. So, ours as well. Right. well thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it, and hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 